The Brutally Speaking podcast is proudly sponsored by Starving Artist Brewing. Starving Artist Brewing may be a small speck on Michigan's beer map, but they say big things come in small packages. A brewery who really puts their money where their mouth is, supporting underground artists far and wide. Making delicious beers with the simple belief that you should judge beer, not people. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. With over 500,000 officially licensed items in their online store, you're guaranteed to find something you need. Use our code BRUTALLY and get 10% off your total purchase order. Now on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is the returning Tom Denny, formerly of A Day to Remember, currently of Sounds Like Colors. This was a really fun chat, and as you'll end up hearing, um, this was kind of brought on by the fact that I had lost Tom's number. Um, Literally, as we start talking right out the gate, I had lost Tom's number And all due to just upgrading my phone, apparently not saving everything, and thought I had lost his contact. And honestly, he never really has been super active on socials, um, so it's kind of hard to be like, oh, I'll send him a DM and he'll he'll see it. Um, So when he kind of disappears for a little bit off socials, and I thought I lost his number, I was like, fuck, I I don't have a way to get a hold of him anymore. Because I, I straight up just didn't even have the contact number. Um, and as you'll hear, it wasn't until I was going through an old laptop and happened to come across his number when it synced up my uh, iTunes account or my iMessaging account, whatever, that I was like, oh, fuck, I got his number again. So I'd reached out to him. And it it's kind of interesting because, and you know, and I didn't really explain this in the chat, but I'll kind of go a little bit more in depth because this is just kind of the reality of the world we live in now. Um, <clears throat> I too often have had people that I'm very close with and the algorithms of social media and so forth don't put their shit in front of you. I guess if you don't interact with it enough or them, you, and they just kind of fall off the grid. And it isn't until you kind of realize like, huh, I stopped noticing blanks posts. And that actually was the the impetus of a conversation I had with a friend of mine was that I was like, Oh, I thought maybe you were mad at me or something. I just wasn't seeing your stuff. thought maybe you unfriended me. I don't know. And, You know, we had talked about how funny it is that the algorithm will do that to you. It'll make friends seem like they're not friends. It'll probably cause problems that don't even exist. And sadly, about a week after that, I'd lost that friend, my friend Megan. Um, Even more, you know, kind of sad about it is her and I had done a podcast when I had started doing this podcast. And the file got corrupted, and we always talked about doing another one. And unfortunately, life just got too busy, and we we never did it. We never did that that second chat, that second chance at a first chat. And with Tom, I'm going to be real honest. You know, when we first started talking and communicating, when we did the podcast before, you know, he seemed kind of angry, um, seemed to be running away from who he was as a person and I could still get a sense of who he is. I think he's a genuinely good dude. Um, based on the conversations I have, he's, he's always quick to reply. You know, he very sincere and honest and heartfelt in the conversations and things we've talked about. He's even revealed things to me that I, I don't know that many people are aware of. Um, And those are things that are going to stay between him and I. But it's one of those things where I felt really bummed when I had lost his contact information because I I felt like he was kind of looking for people who needed to be there for him. And as someone who's lost a lot of my friends um, in sort of the same manner, I I felt really bad. I felt really bad because I, I didn't want to go through that same experience again with someone that I I had kind of built a really personal connection with very quickly to know that 
potentially if something were to have happened to Tom, given kind of where he was when we first met, that I didn't want it to kind of be this thing where, you know, maybe I had given up on him or that the the relationship was one-sided or whatever. Um, that's something I take very personally with a lot of my friendship is friendships is that I really do try to to be there for everybody as much as I can. And I know that's almost impossible to be there for the amount of people that I know. But I always try to do my best to check in, to be there for people. Um, I feel like that's what anyone would do if you're a, a good friend to someone. And the other thing that was really interesting about the connection and the timing of, of reconnecting with Tom is it's sort of in this weird space where I feel like the world sometimes will put people in your life when they're supposed to be there and you'll kind of connect and, and, and people have a purpose. And at times it was this thing where I wouldn't really believe that I wouldn't really lean into it. And if, you know, I kind of said, if there's a new year's resolution, it's, I'm going to kind of try to lean into what I feel the world is putting in front of me for, for whatever reason it may be. I don't know. And it just is very serendipitous as Tom and I were reconnecting over the last couple of weeks that it's like, man, we were just the time apart. It seems like while we were apart, we really were going through a lot of the same things, coming to the same conclusions. And it really felt good to kind of reconnect. And, and as you'll hear in this conversation, I feel like Tom is in a way happier place. And you can just, even in a text where tone and everything is lost, I feel like I could tell that he was different. I could tell that he was happier. I could tell that he had transformed and gone through some shit and come out the other side a way better person than he was before he went through those things. I know I have those very similar experiences myself. And it was really good to be able to connect with him for the show. And I think, you know, we get right into it. And he didn't hold back. Um, that's the thing I love about Tom. He is unapologetically himself. Um, so with this episode and with this chat, you'll you'll get to kind of hear the Tom I know the Tom I befriended, the Tom that I'm really glad I've reconnected with very recently. Um, so without further ado, this is my conversation with Tom Denny. And I'll talk to you all on the other side of it. Um, so it's funny, like, I guess let's start kind of at the beginning of where this kind of started again. Uh, technology fucking sucks sometimes. And when you get a new phone, you know, they always tell you to back it up and do all this other shit. And yeah. I just, I feel like I do, but then sometimes like I got a new phone and everything went through, but a lot of times, like all the numbers, like all my texts would just be like numbers and not names anymore. Right. And sometimes I get a little weirded out about randomly texting numbers where I'm like, I think this is so-and-so based on the yeah. conversation I had. So I was like, I was on my old laptop and it popped up all my fucking text messages and it had one of yours. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to send Tom a text. Cause now I got, I know this is his number, at least what it used to be. So I texted right. you kind of out of the blue and I was like, Hey, not sure if this is still your number, but you know, I've been meaning to reach out to you for a while. And, uh, coincidentally at the same time you had just started going back on social media and posting you know new music was coming and all that so sometimes i think the uh the world serendipitously sends us signals uh unintentionally to put people back in into each other's lives so um For sure. really this this whole thing is i think just you and i catching up i mean some of the text messaging you and i have done over the last week or two i feel like you and i are in a a lot of the same headspaces with what life is kind of thrown at us and, and all that kind of stuff. So I guess, uh, first thing, like the fuck have you been up to, <laughs> you know, just, just fucking working on music again. You know, I took some time off, uh, as you know, <clears throat> I took a few years off. I had to get my head right. You know, um, you know, I got to a place in, in music where I just was, I mean, I was just exhausted mentally hmm. physically and i just had to i had to i had to get away for a while and i ended up taking like four years off to you know pursue like you know filmmaking and really just other artistic endeavors to like uh, scratch my creative itch you know while i was getting my shit together and um a couple of years ago i decided to to come back and 
uh, start working on music again. And here we are. <laughs> well, I know, and to kind of catch some people up who maybe haven't heard from you in a while since our last chat, at least, because I don't think you've really done much in the way of podcasts or any media, uh, like interviews or anything, but you know, I know a while ago you had moved out to LA. You were trying to do film and scoring and stuff like that. And I know the last time when we first kind of started talking, you're you're back in Florida or were at the time. Um, I guess kind of kind of catch back up with that a little bit too. Like what? Because LA is weird to me. I don't think you and I have actually talked about this, so this will be kind of a fun little segue, I guess. But like, LA just wasn't it for me. Like I only was there for maybe like a week, and I was like, this just isn't it. Like I just people feel fake as fuck and. Like it just, it's full of people who are hustling, but I feel like it's full of people who are hustling in a disingenuous way because they're trying to just take whatever they can get off of you, your connections or whatever. And that's just from an outsider who was there, like I said, for a brief amount of time, just observing my surroundings. But I feel like people like I originally from the East coast and I say like, we are a hustling type of people. Um, right. we, we are fast moving. We work hard. And I don't know if it's because constantly we, have to kind of adhere to the people who are three hours behind or ahead of us or behind us, however you want to look at it and having to meet their expectations at all times that you're just like, fuck, I got to get this done because they are expecting it by this time, but there's not that same expectation the other way forward. So what was kind of your experience living out that way and kind of trying to, to make your way in all that? Yeah, it's definitely a similar experience. I hated it. it you know, it was <laughs> not for me at all. Um, you know, and, and that's an interesting take on, on being from the East coast too. It, it's like, you know, uh, I think subconsciously, uh, it, it's always like we, when you're an artist, not from California, it's always been in your, it's always in your head. Like there's this, like, there's this other magical place where all the artists gather and they're doing these like spectacular things. So like. It, it is like kind of in your head to where you want to like push yourself harder and because you feel like you have to because you're not where all the art is or all of the all the musicians or you know, filmmakers or whoever um and then i moved there and i realized that's not that's bullshit it's like it's it's the same everywhere you know it's just like it's it's different there because er there's so many people trying to do the same thing that and it's like harder to get anything done because nobody like nobody and i'm not saying it's like this for everybody but it, it 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 just it's it's a lot harder to get anything done there because everybody's doing something you know like it's like it's harder to stand out it's harder to meet people or, or have like valuable relationships with people out there because everybody's everybody's doing the same shit as you you know and like it's really hard to stand out and i don't know it just wasn't for me that's for sure <laughs> kind of speaking <clears throat> honestly because i know you and i that's kind of the foundation of how our our relationship of friendship started was kind of just being really upfront and honest with each other about things that we think and, and experiences we've gone through and uh all those kind of things but to me at the time i felt like when you were kind of going so hard into film and score i'm not discrediting that it it wasn't something you were passionate about but i had wondered if it was really because you were had maybe been scorned from the music business side of things that yeah. you were trying to go make your name in something else where you weren't Tom from a day to remember you weren't Tom yeah. as a producer, you weren't this, this former version of yourself, maybe that you weren't as proud of anymore, or maybe didn't have as much self. What's the word I'm looking for? Didn't have as much, uh, confidence in yourself anymore in that capacity so trying to go somewhere new and, and make a new life and a new name for yourself it kind of seemed to be what you were chasing at the time to me is, is that accurate that is 100 percent accurate <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> what happened yeah you know i, I got <clears throat> i got to a point where i was uh like you said I, I like lost confidence in myself because i was not happy i was miserable and I didn't know how to fix it. I didn't know like how to like, um, s like solve the problems I had that was going on inside myself, you know, the problems I had with myself. I didn't even probably, I don't even think I really understood that I had those problems with myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time, you know, I was also 
you know, I got addicted to drugs, which, which complicates literally everything. So <laughs> I really like, you know, I was, I was running from everything. And, mm. and at the time I thought, I thought I didn't realize I was running. I thought I was like going where I wanted to go, but it was, it was just like a, yeah, it was just, it was just a complicated time for me and I needed something to distract me from my own bullshit you know what i'm saying because it was so heavy for me to fix at the time i just i didn't even want to i didn't even want to exist as myself anymore at that at that po a point you know what i mean so i was trying really hard to like just do something different like you said not be me you know right be, exist in some other capacity to make myself feel better but it didn't work because uh, it never does obviously you know <laughs> it, it, it's not gonna work you have to you have to you know, you have to deal with your shit. You know, you have to be honest with yourself. That's like the first most important thing I feel like as a human. Was there a looking back, was there an impetus of what kind of made you get to that realization to start working on yourself? Um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of like hit rock bottom, you know, um, starting uh entire new life like going like leaving everything behind it's not easy obviously you know and, and it really was like i i got to a point where like i just i was like i was really 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 depressed and really like miserable you know and i don't know i it just got to a point where I had no choice. Like I, my only options were to completely give up and, or, or figure out what, what, what my deal is and where I need to be in my life. And, um, and when I started to like really think about it and, um, you know, I got some therapy, so I was able to speak out my problems. I started to realize that, you know, music wasn't the problem you know like the music industry wasn't the problem the problem was inside of me and and i had to i had to work on it and slowly you know it took some time but i finally you know i got to a better place and you know thankfully now i'm in a way better place so i think and that was something you and i had kind of been texting about was you know both of us kind of having this moment of something happening to us where we're like, I'm not okay. And I need help. But like, I think, you know, I talk all the time and, you know, I actually just had a friend of mine reach out to me the other day and he was like, I know this is going to sound weird, but you know, I was listening to an episode and I love how you talk about therapy and, and what it does for you and how it allows you to solve problems and, and kind of get out of your own way and, and just the, the positives that it can do for you. And you know, it's like I told him, I was like, it's one of those things to me where I know it's it's a dead fucking horse. I've been beaten to death for like almost two years now. But to me, it's like someone might listen to this episode only. They may have never heard any of the other ones where I talk about this stuff. And so I was like, maybe it'll give them the permission or the acceptance to go like, man, like if this is someone I look up to and, and they're talking about you know, what therapy has done for them and, and kind of feeling those same feelings that, you know, potentially you were, or more so to this point, you have just expressed, then I hope it, I hope people take that step uh, to finding themselves and being able to kind of get out of it. Because I feel like there are times internally we talk about, I was at my lowest. I was, and I wouldn't say I was at my lowest in any real sense of the, the word when most people are like, this was my point. I, I, it was either this or I fucking kill myself. Yeah. I wasn't there. But I realized emotionally and mentally I was taking on so much of everyone else's stuff. And all I was doing was keeping it inside me that it was like that was my breaking point was just like I can't keep taking on everyone else's stuff and having to be that person for all these other people when I don't have that same thing or an outlet for myself because it is going to affect me negatively. And it has been. Oh, yeah. And what was super scary to me was being able to do this was actually a blessing in disguise where – I did this and the fact that I was able to just turn on the, Hey, how are you doing customer yeah. service type face shit? And it was like, there's something fucking wrong about that. I shouldn't be able to just put literally put on a face for this or for customer service people or whatever, and just hide everything that I fucking have going on internally. And it's like, that's not okay. Yeah. And that was the real breaking point for me of just like, 
man, if I do that and I don't think I have it that bad, how fucking bad are people in the day to day that I inter- in- encounter? And I just have no idea. Right. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it, I've never been really good at, at, um, at putting on a face, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm really bad at faking how I feel, which, you know, I think <clears throat> being able to do that is probably more dangerous f- for you. Um, but I feel like, uh, there's some aspects of not being able to do it that that <laughs> cause problems too because like you you know you i just for for a long time i just was like a miserable piece of shit not not really to me i was you know when right. it's it's interesting because when i talk to people that uh was around me a lot back then when i was really going through it like uh their perspective on on this situation isn't even nearly as bad as i remember it being but i was also the one going through it you know what i'm saying right and um so to me i was like no there's no way i was fun to be around because i was feeling (laughs) i felt so like terrible like there's no way you know and i just was not I i wasn't happy with myself and um you know that's like obviously like it's so important to to try to figure out how to be contempt in life and be happy with who you are you know like it's like it's really easy to um to go through life and experience hardships and then because of those hardships and the trauma or whatever you experience you 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 try to uh you know you, you you put up these like walls and and you, you're like basically faking who you are and avoiding who you are and and running from who you are and how you feel and and you eventually if you do it for long enough you really start to become uh, like a different person than who you actually are and if you do it too long you could start to believe that and that i think that's where the danger comes and that's what happened with me it's like I was so unhappy with myself for so long. Like I, I, I morphed myself into somebody that I didn't recognize anymore, and mm-hmm. it just got so bad. Where, I, you know, that's that's kind of what led me to leave the music industry because I, I, I just I felt like, I don't know, I just I didn't feel like myself, you know. So, um, yeah, it was uh, hard times for sure. <clears throat> it's interesting because. You, you sort of touched on something that is a thought I've had for a while and I've never really been able to, I think, articulate it very well. So I'm going to kind of ask the question, I guess, of course, and explain it from my point of view and then kind of see if maybe you can help me work through my question. I feel like the music industry is in a lot of industries I'll say in entertainment are interesting because when you're at the top, everyone, everyone's your fucking friend. Everyone tells you how great you are. You got a lot of hanger ons and you got a lot of people in the industry. Like, you know, we'll, we'll uh, correlate it to bands. You know, if you tour well with a band, you, you know, they'll, you do tours back and forth. You might just swap, you know, features and all that kind of stuff. And it becomes this thing where sometimes I wonder, like, we'll say like if a band just, has like a shit record or does something wrong. I don't know what boom. Like now all of a sudden they're almost like forgotten about for a little while. And I always wonder like, what is that experience like? Because I feel like if these are your ride or dies, these are your people that you're fucking homies with. Why don't they fucking bring you up? And I know like the industry, as far as touring goes, it's a lot about what are your numbers? What are your draws? What are you now socials? What are your social numbers and shit? It's a lot of variables that don't fucking matter. But I feel like to a certain level, if you are at a headlining level, you should be able to be like, you know what, man, I'm going to throw my friends a fucking bone and bring them out because we're homies and that's just what we do. But I don't feel like that exists to a certain a certain extent until you come back on the come up and then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, shit, man. Yeah, man, we're good now. And you're like, but where the fuck was you before? Right. And yeah. I feel like you probably could speak to that more than anyone else. I, I without talking specifics, but like, I feel like you could kind of talk about that a little bit more because you were in it from a band perspective. You were in it from a producing perspective. You were in it, I believe from management perspective as well. So like you're kind of multifaceted in the industry. And I feel like for you to have hit this level where you're like, I can't be me in this industry anymore. And I got to go so far the fuck away from it that I feel like you could speak to what I've kind of been wondering for the longest time. Like where are those people and why doesn't it, correlate to real friends being real friends for people i think you know with the music industry probably any uh 
well, I'm not going to say any industry because I only know the music industry, but, you know, with the music industry, it gets complicated because, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're, a lot of times you're doing it with friends and people you trust and, um, or you, you think you are, or you want to, you know, um, and then there's the other side of the coin where it, at the end of the day, it's a business, like before everything, right. you know, and it, and it has to operate as a business. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes some people get so like, um, used to treating it like a business and looking at it like a business that, uh, it, it starts to overshadow the friendship side of it. it, it you know what I'm saying? What, yeah. you know, without even realizing it maybe. And I think it's really easy to lose friends and, and things like that because you're, or whoever is, is too focused on the business side of things. I do know bands that, that aren't like that. You know, there are some that treat people, their friends and everything, um, like their friends always, but, but still at the end of the day it's it's still a business and you have to be really um you know you have to be cautious of that but i don't know i i think it's like any i think it's like any situation um there's there's shitty people and there's good people and then you know money and and fames can can pollute any relationship you know it's really easy to to get caught up in in and being popular and famous and and having respect and getting money and paid and it's like it's just it's it's i guess it's the part of the industry i never really liked obviously because i'm really big on um loyalty and respect you know and you know there's there's been times where i thought that it the loyalty and respect was mutual and it, uh, it wasn't you know it, it, which I'm sure it happens all the time, but you know, there's really, I, I think it's just like a, a human nature thing. I don't think it's really the music industry uh, specifically. I think it's just how human beings operate, you know? So it's funny. Cause like at times I think of that Drake line where it's like, um, something to the effect of like, I never know what to say to the people who reach out to me because they want to help because they think I can help them get back to where they fell from. Yeah. And I just like think of that line and I'm like, shit, is that kind of more of what it is where it's like someone will reach out to you and they think like you can put them on and get them back. And it's weird because like at times listening to and I'm definitely not for anyone listening to this. I am not saying that this is what this person has said. This is 100 percent me listening to this show and me gleaming this from him. But or from the exchanges. But when I listen to Doc Coyle's podcast sometimes, and he has some people that came up when God forbid was kind of coming up in the early, early two thousands and so forth, you'll see these like band dudes and they're like, yo man, if, if God, for, or if uh, bad wolves ever needs an opening band, man, we'll be there. We'll be there, you know, ready to go because they see them, you know, getting on these tours, like the Nickelbacks and so forth and playing stadiums and having number one hits and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, God, that's gotta be really hard to kind of be like, I mean, it's, it's not up to me. Like I'm not the booker of our band. You know, we're, we're basically the support band on all these tours, but like, it's just interesting to watch people that have had careers, but then also adversely see so many people who are like, if this A and R dude didn't fuck us, if this label didn't fuck us, if this tour would have done what it was supposed to. And it's like, right. you're 20 fucking years later, still the world owes me the world. Fuck me. And you take no responsibility for anything you may have done. Cause you were trying to get the bag initially. And now you fumbled the shit and it fucked your career. Like you got to take yeah. some ownership of that. And I feel like I just, I don't see a lot of that either, which has been kind of the breath of fresh air from when you and I first kind of started, you know, talking, years ago was that it you know you kind of took a lot of ownership of of your own things and i kind of was like you don't fucking hear that that often so yeah yeah that's something like um that's really important to me as well and um i think it probably comes from getting sober um you know like having to like look inside and see my problems and fix them um i and i think it's really important for anybody like it can't always be everybody else's fault. You know what I'm saying? Like you, like you, it, if you find yourself blaming everybody 
for every problem that exists in your life, then, you know, maybe there's, there's something that you need to figure out inside, you know, and, 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 and work on because, you know, everybody's got problems, literally everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, how famous you are, how rich you are. I mean, everybody's got issues and a lot of them are very similar issues. And, um, you know, you have to, I don't know, you have to fix yourself before you can fix the world. Right. You know? So I feel like that's the thing that as I get older, I tend to be more notice of noticing is that I'll be more willing to admit my own faults and my mistakes and take ownership of being a hand in it. Because, but I also feel like I, I have seen too many other people use, like I'll use the example of relationships of like dating and so forth. You know, I have a lot of friends that when they would break up with someone like, oh, that fucking person's crazy, this, 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 and this, just a laundry list of shit. And I would just be like, isn't it fucking crazy and wild that you're the only other constant in this, but it's always somebody else's fault, never your own. How right. that must be nice to have just, you know, attract crazy people and it's yeah. never you. And then, you I, know, I get a lot of like, what's that mean? And I go, you're the only constant in this other than that. You should right. start looking inward and going, what am I doing to contribute to these things happening? Right. Maybe it's just nothing more than I'm attracted to toxic people because I want to fix people. Right. And if you can realize that about yourself, then maybe you're able to then kind of look at the, the world you put yourself in through that lens and realize like, oh, I guess this is maybe a, a bad trait of mine that I need to work on is that I can't save everybody. So I need to stop putting myself in these situations and fix the problem. Yeah, I think it's also really easy or not easy, but easier to, to blame other people, uh, than it is to blame yourself or, or look at yourself and be like, oh, okay, this is what's wrong with me because, you know, nobody wants to admit, uh, that they have problems or that they're the problem of the situation. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really, I, I think it takes, uh, going through a lot of, of shit in life to get to a point where you're comfortable with admitting you're the problem you know what i'm saying it's not it's not easy to do um it took me a long time to to be able to do that you know and realize and i'm not perfect obviously still i still um could work on myself a little more but i definitely uh i mean i had to do that with my with myself i had to like i had to figure out the issues that I was causing myself and other people and my relationship to people. And I don't know, it's just really, it's really important for anybody to be able to do that. I think, you know, a um, couple of kind of more questions along this, this line of thought moving back home. How was that for you? And, and what was the, when you could essentially move anywhere, what was the reasoning and rationale behind going back home? Um, <clears throat> I think it just, you know, I, I grew up here, my, my, my family's here, my wife's family's here. It's just, I don't know. There's just something that's always like safe about where I'm from, you know, from my hometown, it's just like comfortable. And when we left California, I felt very unsafe because, you know, it, it just, I was I was very unhappy there and it made me feel very like disconnected from, I don't know, everything in my life. And it was easy to not easy, but you know, it was <clears throat> the easiest option than rather mm -hmm. like going and starting over again, which didn't go so well the first time, <laughs> um, coming back home. It just, it like, it felt better. It felt good to come back to, you know, a place we know, uh, family. It's just, it was like a, I guess it was like a temporary fix of the, the chaos that, that we were escaping, <laughs> which was <laughs> California. <laughs> <laughs> you ended up actually touching on the next thing I kind of wanted to talk on because it was, it was one of my favorite parts of the chats. Cause actually, I don't know if I ever mentioned this when I put out the episode, but I basically married two different conversations we had together yeah. because I found sort of a, a middle point where we had discussed enough of the similar things that I could loop in the other part and make it one cohesive whole thing. And honestly, the bridge between it, between the two chats was talking about uh, your wife, 
um, yeah. and the relationship you guys had had at that point. I'm happy to hear. Um, I was actually as creepy as this is to say what little bit of photos you posted. Uh, and I actually just noticed you had your ring on as well. Still, yep. Yep. Um, that I was trying to see if if everything still was good on that front, because I know in our previous conversations, you know, that was kind of the, the guiding light and the saving for you is that, you know, like your wife has your back and, and that you were committed to making things right, you know, for each other and, you know, moving across country and kind of trying to start a new life together not knowing what you know the outcome could be to now you know still essentially the same thing going back home and reconnecting and, and kind of re-establishing your roots where they always were i feel like is a, is a great thing and i'm glad to hear that you guys are still together in light of having to go through more chaos and, and uncertainty in, in your marriage because i feel like it's only strengthened it even more at this oh, point hey absolutely i mean she's she's my best friend she's literally there's not enough words to describe my appreciation for you know what i'm saying like she saved my literally saved my life like i know people say that i'm i can't tell you how serious i am i would not be here today if it wasn't for her several times i wouldn't have got clean i wouldn't have got through the hard times she was like the thing like it, it was like the light at the end of the tunnel my wife you know it's like uh it's 100 percent, and we've been married for 13 years now it's better than Congrats. ever yeah thank you very much yeah it's she's definitely she's definitely my my savior <laughs> it's interesting because like i joke all the time because my wife does not listen to the show does not you know she supports definitely supports me doing all this but like it's kind of like i go off and it's time that i'm not spending with her technically although she's at work and i'm not but it was a thing where you know we're approaching uh seven years married as of a couple of weeks ago and been together for 13. so nice. it's one of those <coughs> excuse me where you know i think about who we are now versus who we were you know being together for almost a third of our lives at this point and it's one of those crazy things where there's definitely times where I feel like each of us through insecurities of my own that I have to, you know, when I talk to her and I'm like, I, like being real. Cause I feel like you've been more vulnerable this whole chat than I have. So I'll get real and vulnerable with you. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things where she is the breadwinner. She makes the money. She allows me and her to have the life that we do where we get to travel and go experience new things and see the world around us. And it's one of those things to me, like, I don't ever have insecurities about not making as much money as she does. My insecurity comes from, and I don't even know if it is an insecurity. It's just, I feel like being real where I'm like, when she started to make the money she was making, I was like, would you rather be with someone who has, you know, a career that pays them e like we're an equal to you in that sense. So you could get more out of your vacations instead of essentially having to pay for two people. This person can go and take you on these trips. This person can go do these things with you and be an equal in that capacity. And she was just like, no. And it's one of those things where it's like, I don't have the insecurity of being like, well, I'm the man and I have to support and do all these things. But I've had to learn how to work through my own things in that capacity because I want my wife to be happy. I want her to see and do all these things that I know she wants to do. And I have come to learn that the easiest way for me to do it is just to kind of be a facilitator for her. So like, a lot of times when she's like, do you want to go do this on this trip? Do you want to go do this? Do you want to go do this? And I'm like, I will go and do whatever you want because I'm going to have fun with you doing the thing. The rest of it is whatever. And it's, I think, being able to be real with your spouse and have those kind of hard conversations that allow you to have the longevity of you know myself at 13 years. And I'm sure dating-wise, you have a couple more years in front of that before you got married. But I, I think it's also an important thing to talk about maintaining relationships and, and those that are valuable. You will stick through the hard conversations, the hardships that you face as a couple, and you will get through it and you'll be stronger when you come out the other side of it together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, uh, an important aspect to any marriage is, is honesty and support. You, you got to support each other no matter what. And you have to be honest about everything as well. You know, I feel like you either when you get married as young, especially um, we were my wife was 23. I was 26. Um, I think you either grow together or you grow apart. 
you know, and mm. I think I think it's really easy to to do both. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think it probably there's a lot of variables that probably are in play to decide that. But you know, and I think uh, when you grow together, you just you know, like me and my wife, like we we like understand each other so well. Like we we don't really have to have heavy conversations because we probably nine times out of 10 feel the same way period about everything because we've been together so close for so long. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even remember. I barely remember existing without being married to her. So, so like every decision and every influence it's been in my life, like she's always been there and, um, and we're, we're really similar. So, I think you know understanding each other uh each other's boundaries each other's like uh you know like each other's uh everything you know just trying to like i don't know it's important to just know each other and like respect the things that are good and bad about not not bad about the person but you know what i'm trying to say like uh try to it's it's important to respect each other the desires and and the things that you're trying to accomplish in life so that way you can do it together you know and i feel like that that's one of the things that makes a, a marriage really successful is you know doing everything together not like literally doing everything together but <laughs> accomplishing things together and you know uh, i don't know some marriages just don't do that some people just they have totally separate lives which may work for some people but for my marriage it's not it doesn't work that way you know we're we're very much one life you know <laughs> <laughs> well I, I feel like to a degree maybe it's more of just <clears throat> like you know I've, I've said countless times on this show that like my wife loves trashy tv and i just don't <laughs> give a fuck about it like yeah. but i've also learned that instead of being there but shitting on the thing i'd rather just be like i'll tell you what i'm gonna go do podcast things i'm gonna go play video games things that you're not really interested in either we're gonna give each other our our time to go do the thing that we enjoy and then we'll come back after a certain amount of time either you know when that show's done or whatever but i think it allows us to kind of explore our passions and our hobbies yeah while also not being negative to the other person because they aren't, don't get them or don't enjoy them equally as much. And I feel like that's, if there's like any wisdom of being married or being in a couple that, I, you know, I can bestow to anyone is I, I feel like it's that you don't have to give up your individuality for each other to be in the relationship that you just have to find a way to make it work. And I feel like you can apply that to just about any relationship really though. Oh, of course. Um, uh the same thing applies to friendships i think too you know uh, you don't have to have the same views or uh, you know interests to to have a really good friendship or relationship with people you just have to respect the other person's views and uh, interests you know what i'm saying um yeah. sometimes it can be <clears throat> it can be difficult especially in today's political climate you know it's like you you can end up having some wildly different views and it, and it might interfere with your friendship but you got to try to just not you know you have to respect other people's um you know what they what they feel and believe and i don't know some people it's hard to do that um i think it's like hard to put some people i think it's hard to put their their mind in other people's shoes you know it's like hard to to view things from different perspectives it's something i've always really tr um, tried to be good at is is you know even it, it, views to me that m may seem absolutely insane i try my hardest to 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 look at things from their point of view and understand why i wonder why they feel that way or think that way um I may not agree with it and I may not ever understand it, but I try at least. And I think that's important to be able to like, you know, openly view things from other people's perspective uh, respectfully as well. You know, I feel like if you are someone who tries to just think has a very active mind, I feel like it'd be hard not to, because, you know, one of the greatest things 
that I've learned to do, I'd say in the last handful of years is really just admit that I don't know everything Yeah, totally. and be willing to let people teach me something, or at least give me a different side of something I may not have ever thought of Yeah, and take in that information and then start drawing my own conclusions. And I feel like that has been such a game changer for me because someone can talk about politics, religion, whatever. And I may not, may not agree with, with the side the person's coming from, but maybe you can say something that will make me think a little bit differently about those things yeah. to where then I'll kind of be like, huh, all right, well let's, let's kind of explore that a little bit more or I'll take it on my own and I'll explore it a little bit more and kind of see what then comes from it. But I think, I don't know. I, I find it so interesting that we live with literally a world's worth of information at our fingertips at all times. Yeah. And I know like I'm equally bad at doing this, like where, you know, I'll, I'll be with friends or whatever, and I'll just randomly think of something and then I'll like start Googling it. But then instead of just looking for the one answer or whatever the top answer is, I'll kind of be like, all right, what, what are some other things that may be related to this? So I can see if like maybe the first thing I found was bullshit or it's not. Yeah. And there are times where, you know, like between my wife and a lot of her friends that are all in like, you know, the pharmaceutical side of the world and stuff like that. And I'll, you know, come from uh, chemistry backgrounds and all this kind of stuff and went to like U of M and prestigious colleges and, and all this. And they're like, you're smarter than all of us. I'm like, I don't think I'm smarter. I just think that like you all went to school, had to go for such a thing that's so stressful and the job you have is stressful that you don't really have the the capacity to want to learn anything because like your, yeah. your day-to-day is that. Mine is like, I work at a brewery and I deal with dumb people. Like, yeah. mm, <laughs> you know, if I bring them their beer or their food, they're just like, is this yours? I don't know. And they're like, how do you not know? Right. And <laughs> it's things like that. But like, you know, I'll be like, oh, do you, you know, like, do like, I remember one day my wife's like, you're always on your phone. And I was like, sorry, I was Googling at bees sleep because we had uh, bees at the end of our driveway. And I wanted to try to figure out if I could get them away from there so they don't sting me or us. And yeah. she was like, oh, well, do they? And I was like, they don't sleep. They just go into a less dormant state at night, but they're still moving. Right. And she was like, oh. And I was like, so then I looked up different videos of them doing this. And if it's only one type of bee that does this or do all bees do this? And she was just like, and see, that's why you're smarter than me. Cause like I would, I would have that thought and then just go Meh, and then just yeah. not even look <laughs> it up. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like I had, like, again, I have the ability to look that up. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. And I feel like there's too much of that where people are inquisitive, but either aren't willing to seek out knowledge or they aren't willing to maybe be challenged on the knowledge they currently have. Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. A lot of people um, either think they know the things that they know, if that makes sense, or mm -hmm. the or they're not interested in learning anything about the things that they know. So they're just like, they like lock onto the knowledge that they have and then no other information is, is possible you know what i'm saying i'm more like you where i am i'm always open to learning i love learning new things i'm so fascinated by by everything you know what i'm saying and i do the same thing i google stuff i i watch a lot of random youtube and tiktok videos about stuff that literally has no effect in my life but i think <laughs> like the, the process of learning you know um opens your mind up to and it like trains your brain to be able to think differently mm -hmm. in a positive way and i think that's really important to never stop um being able to to learn you know that's like the i feel like it's like uh it's like the way to never to never age or feel old you know because like when i you know, I'm 40 now. If I'm like on TikTok learning things, like I don't know, I don't feel 40 <laughs> mentally. You know, I feel like anytime you're like learning, it's like, oh man, I feel like a little bit younger than I actually am. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, I feel like they've always said the the like the foolish man is one that never learns. And yeah, I mean, like you you always hear those stories of like when. Like this idea of retiring, like it's something, the concept of retiring is something that I find fascinating because, you know, you can, we can talk about the, the political system or the economical system that we live in currently here in the States. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll never be able to retire because of X, Y, or Z. 
I don't know if I go for all of that. I also just a hundred percent because it's literally something that my wife and I have talked about where she's like, if I make X amount more, you don't really need to work. Like you don't need a job because I can then pay all the bills. Like I can take care of these things. And to some people, they're like, oh my God, that would be the dream. And I'm like, yeah, I'd still need to do something. I, I can't yeah. just, I can't just be like, I can't, I would have to go do something for some sort of a job, some sort of a, like whatever. And maybe it would be a thing of like, I would just start cranking out more of these because I find this to almost be a form of therapy where I can kind of talk through ideas, talk through things and learn from other people, which was a great thing during the pandemic when everyone kind of lost that. I at least had this already established yeah. and could keep, you know, expounding upon that. But I just don't think the idea of never learning, never doing something and just being stagnant, there's just no fucking way I could ever do that. No. And I feel like you see people when they have using this term loosely, nothing to live for. Yeah. That's when they age and just die off because they're like, like, and you see it with people with spouses that have been together for 30, 40 years and then their spouse dies and they sh die shortly thereafter. Cause it's like, that was my everything. And I have nothing left to live for. Cause that was yeah. my whole world. And it's like, I could totally understand how that would be. Cause in this few instances, like my wife will go on trips or go on work trips or whatever, it's kind of nice for a couple of days. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I can clean the house and the house is going to stay clean. And like, I don't have to like put up with real housewives of whatever city or whatever. I can just kind of <laughs> do my own thing. Yeah. But then I also realize, like after like two days or so, I'm like, oh, fuck man, I don't have anyone to talk to at home and like, oh, yeah, I don't have anything yeah. to do. And then you just kind of like, Oh, I could see how that's a real thing that happens to people. Cause there's like well, my everyday thing. My partner is gone. Like, yeah. what the fuck do I do with my life now? Yeah. Yeah. My, um, me and my dad talk about this quite a bit because he's 70 and uh you know he was a a painter most of his life and he retired like residential painting or yeah he painted houses and stuff so okay. he um when he retired in the 60s he like immediately just got a job at like a it's like it's like a it's like a regular store and i was like what are you doing you know like retire dad just you know you just just do stuff around the house He's like, I can't. He tell, and he, we talk about it all the time. He's like, if I just didn't work and I just laid around, he's like, man, that's when people die. Like that's that's when you like literally lose it. He's like, I I need something. I need something to get me up in the morning and to get me going. And I have to go somewhere. Like it's really important for me to keep that, you know, that. Uh, um, it's almost that, a regimented schedule, kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's important, you know. And, and once you lose all that. It's like, what do you now? What you know, like now, what are you gonna do? Play bingo? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's probably like, it, it's probably really depressing, especially because you're later, you're, you're older, and it just it, everything feels like you're you're like losing everything anyway. You probably lost most of the people in your life. It's like, so when you lose your career too, it's just got it's got to feel, got to feel really bad. So I could see where my dad comes from. Um, where he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to retire because he's, he needs it, you know, and I think it's important for sure. Talking about this, just actually, and again, this is why I love doing this, hearing you say that actually just maybe come to this conclusion I've never really thought of, but I wonder if it's because the idea of retiring and all this kind of stuff is that you essentially, in, from a mental capacity, maybe have become obsolete. You're not needed. Right. Yeah. You don't serve a purpose anymore. Yeah, exactly. You're looked at as almost like a liability or like, a, oh, you don't know how to do X, Y, or Z anymore. And it's like, that's yeah. got to be really fucking hard to to deal with. And, and you know, in even taking it a step further, as I kind of had that thought, my thought then became, I wonder if people of our generation and generations coming up behind us are going to find it easier to live longer and not have that feeling because we have grown and been around where technology is just constantly going and allows us, like we were saying earlier to, to research things and to stay, feel staying mentally sharp yeah, and, and a part of our you know faculties and so forth. If that will not have that same effect of like retiring, because we can retire from the one thing, but right. maybe we have something else that we can still look forward to that will still keep us motivated and give us a purpose. Yeah. Whereas the generation's, ahead of us kind of don't have that because yeah. they they maybe didn't adapt to technology and things like that and they just feel left behind at this point yeah it's 
it's a really fascinating idea uh with the internet because you know like we're literally living in like this experiment that nobody's experienced before so like i i think about these things all the time where you know like so, I mean, I didn't have social media when I was a kid, obviously, you know, so nope. <laughs> I didn't, you know, it didn't exist until I was like in my late twenties. So, um, it, it's like interesting how I, like, I'm, I'm definitely fascinated by, uh, being able to like watch how the internet and social media affects, um, you know, like you said, like our generation and the generations behind us in ways that, um, the older generations probably you know missed out on you know what i'm saying from every everything from like <clears throat> like you said learning things and stuff and finding purpose to communication and like um societal uh differences and impacts it's just it's it's going to be really interesting to see one day you know, like look back and i'm sure there's some some college somewhere like studying right now you know they're like taking notes and watching everything it's going to be interesting to learn all that one day, you know, when we're old and we're like, if oh, we ever shit. get to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if we do, if we're privileged <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes that's that's where I try to not let my brain go because I'm like, oh god, like you can just <clears throat> the possibilities are so infinite and so so vast, and like even some of the entertainment I've been taking in recently really kind of reaffirms a lot of my stance on things, like. You know, my wife and I were watching the show Scandal, and it's basically a PR person essentially helps the then president become president. They kind of backtrack whatever. They're entangled. He's married. <laughs> all this kind of shit. But then it's as the show progresses, spoilers, I guess, whatever. Yeah. But it kind of is, well, we're going to do these things to divert you know, smear campaigns or this information from coming out, whatever. So then we started watching the show, the good wife and we're on the last season now. And it's sort of the same, but kind of different. And it's one of those things where they're like, Oh, well this, this information is about to come out. We know this, this leak is about to happen. So fuck it. We're going to get ahead of it. We're going to spin it. We're going to do all these things. And like vote, voting is rigged. These things are rigged. These fucking foreign <laughs> policies and the way that all this shit, like we're going to kill this guy, but it's going to be for the greater good of the government and, and all these other things. And I'm like, see, that's the kind of shit I do believe really fucking exists right. and makes me. And like, I looked at my wife and I was like, this is why I don't want to fucking vote. Cause it don't matter. I could yeah. vote for somebody. <laughs> and then there's a, a fucking <clears throat> something in the system that like will change my vote or it will be fucking taken away or whatever. And I was like, everyone's fucking corrupt everything is not what it seems and i was like and i just i just don't care i was like i would rather i'd rather not be interested because politics and all that shit does not interest me right. i would rather just be blissfully ignorant and unaware because i honestly do feel like and people are probably gonna hate me for this <laughs> but it's like i just don't feel like my voice fucking matters in that capacity so i would instead of voting because someone tells me i need to vote this way or i need to vote this way i'd rather just not vote and let those who are more informed than me make decisions or make an in better informed decision than i could and i want to and yeah. to me i feel like that's the most responsible thing i could do as a registered voter is to not vote because i just don't care i don't I, I kind of feel like it doesn't matter what I do. The end result is still going to be us going through the fucking meat grinder. So I'd rather just be blissfully unaware and just let it happen. And then the, usually the only combative thing that I get said to me is, well, then you don't get to bitch. And I'd be like, and I won't, <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't bitch. Cause I probably won't even understand why it's happening. Right. And I'll just go, it's politics. That's probably why yeah. it's happening. And I just don't care. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely easy to. It's easy to feel like your 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 one vote isn't going to do anything, and in the grand scheme of things, it's definitely not. You know, I feel like the problem comes when millions of people feel that way. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And those millions of people that didn't vote, uh, that's 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 going to make an impact. And it, it it's not this any single person's mentality. It's how do you fix uh, the mentality of of a mass amount of people and gain the trust, you know, of the system and the government. It's like it's just there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think. Well, I'll do you one better. And sorry to cut you off. 
No, you're good. I feel I feel like that is the bigger talking point. No one ever really brings up. Yes, I am the one, but it's when you have a collection of us and there are yeah. thousands or millions of us. Why isn't the question then why like what is it about it? like what could because if that's the case then like how do you reach the people who feel all the same way it's right. not like i'm one of one of one i'm one of, of course yeah of course. a ton so it's like how do you reach me how do you get me interested how do you fix what we feel is broken and to me it's yeah. like i feel like that's the bigger talking point that i don't ever see anyone say is well you should vote because it's important and it's like i don't feel like it is Right. So make me feel like it's important. Make me feel like my one vote or the one of a million votes actually means something. Because by and large, when if you look at everything, it's one side going, you know, we'll, we'll at least speak to a presidency because it literally has an end. You have two terms you can serve. Right. Okay. When that, if the, if a president serves the two terms, all you hear is, well, now we're going to come in and we're going to fix that. Yeah, we're going right. to fix all the wrongs that they've done. And they never do. <laughs> and, and, and then it's by the, if they, you know, after the first term, it's, well, I was, we're getting on track to fixing all the fuck ups yeah, of the other person. Exactly, yeah. And then the other side will come in and do the exact same thing. So all you're doing is, yeah. it's, it's essentially a checks and balance of checking and balancing the other side. And I'm like, exactly. Where is the work and where is all the shit that's supposed to be getting done? I don't ever see it. All you hear about is, well, I had to undo all the, on the, the problems that were there when I took over. And it's like, if you were to look at that as a business, I would just go, you're shit at doing your job. Yeah. 100%. Like something else needs to change and needs to happen. Why aren't we figuring out a new way to do this? I and absolutely to me it's, agree. Yeah, I absolutely and that, agree with you. <laughs> that's where I feel about like all that stuff. And it's just like when you have those kind of conversations with people, you know, everyone's, you know, that's where people will fall in line with, with their, you know, a lot of times religious and political beliefs yeah. tied hand in hand, even though they, yeah, I was going to say a lot of times they're the same for, for a certain certain yeah <laughs> <laughs> um kind well, of getting yeah, off little, of this super serious yeah. topic that everyone yeah. will probably get more <laughs> us for. i know right <laughs> um sounds like color uh yeah where did where did this come from um it kind of happened by accident you know me and um the singer jesse we uh um we started writing music together i I, he was in like a smaller band that i recorded and i produced a couple years ago and he left the band and me and him sometimes like you know as a songwriter i'll write with people that it just it just clicks immediately you know what i'm saying like you know there's just something about the balance of writing with certain singers for me that that works out really well and he was one of them and I don't know. We just, we, we were just, the pl- I guess the plan was to write, just write a bunch of songs and have them like ready mm. whenever uh, a band comes to me and wants to work with me. And I, I could be like, I have all these songs. And like, we did that for a while. And I just, man, I just liked the music so much. And I was so proud of it that I didn't, I didn't want to give it away. Like, I didn't want mm. to give it away to anybody. Like I wanted it to be mine and his, and you know, I wanted to, like, I didn't want to be in a band. I didn't think I did anyway. You know, I, I it wasn't my my goal, but it kind of like evolved into this idea of like, well, I, you know, we should just release this music, like, like let's, let's start something and put it out, and um, and that idea kind of blossomed into something a lot more serious, and um. And that's kind of where we are today, you know. It's, it just kind of turned into something I didn't think I would ever do again, which was being a band, <laughs> you know. There's two parts to the the band, <clears throat> and more kind of focusing on the actual titles and words because I'm I'm someone who likes words and language, and the idea of sounds like color for a band name I think is interesting because I think a lot of times senses are really interesting and especially when you tie them to other things that are connected with those things you know and i feel like anyone who's listening to this show <coughs> excuse me anyone who's listening to the show can probably you can hear a song and they can take you back to where you were when you heard that you know forever yeah. i know i was at the parchment library listening on those giant shitty like library headphones listening to the first corn record. I can tell you where I was when I was listening to it. I can tell you I was sitting on those like shitty blue plastic chairs that shock you every time you sit in them. 
you know, I can tell you who I was with, like things can do that. But yeah, recently in the last couple of years, uh, Andrew from the ghost inside uh, has a band called one decade and the new stuff he put out is cause it's all instrumental. And it's basically the title is the title of the songs are colors. And he said that when he wrote these songs, these are the colors that he kept thinking of and associated associating them with when he was writing this material. And to me, the idea when I saw sounds like color, I was like, that's a really interesting idea and a concept of like, you can hear something and maybe it makes you think of a color. It makes, it takes you to a place. Yeah. Um, what was kind of the, the beginning point of sounds like color as a band name and, and what does, I guess it mean to you? Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the, that's pretty much one of the things that came from, um, you know, when I, when I write music and I could get really in, into the flow state there, you know, I do, I'm not, I'm not going to say I, I literally see colors, you know what I'm saying? But there are colors associated with the music I'm creating. It, it, I think it's it like, like you said with Andrew, like, it's like, I'm thinking, uh, like, as I'm like working on music, there are shades of colors that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about or I'm associating with with the music. I've always been that way, and I think maybe that's part of the reason, like, I'm able to to write certain things so easily because, like, I I can visually associate something with the sounds that I'm creating. You know what I'm saying? And it, it, it there's this connection between between senses like hearing and and seeing and and smelling all the senses to me are are, are very intertwined with each other and that's kind of like where it came from you know i just i don't know it it, it, it just uh it had a good ring to it and it made a lot of sense because it really described my music creation process you know what i'm saying so <clears throat> Adversely, on the other side of it, decoherence, you know, being the first <laughs> single you put out. I don't think that that's actually a word, but I like the idea of, I like this idea of like, you know, adding different prefixes to words and, and kind of changing what the word is and its meaning and so forth. So to me, you know, coherence, you know, being, I'll say when I first think of the word, being of sound body and mind, coherent, you know, yeah. we, we talk about it all the time. You know, especially when you start talking about drinking and drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, the first thing they say is like, you know, you're not coherent right. um, when you've gone through trauma and so forth and you come out of the hospital. They're not coherent. Right. You know, it's it's a word that I think of to me when I hear it thinks of these extremes of like not being able to do something. Yeah. Or you are coherent. So when I hear decoherence, it kind of puts the the opposite effect of the word in my mind. So I, and, you know, even kind of looking through some of the lyrics of the song, what was, where did the idea of decoherence come from? And I guess, what does it mean to you? Uh, well, so this is interesting how, uh, how we write songs. This is, and it's how we wrote songs originally before the band, uh, uh, legitimately formed is, and it's how I write music anyway. I'll, um, when I sit down to write a song, however, like I'm feeling emotionally or wherever I'm at, um, I'll try to capture it in, in a, in a song title, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, decoherence is actually, a um, it's like, a it has something to do with quantum entanglement. And I, at the time I was really interested in quantum mechanics, which is, you know, it's one of the things like we were talking about. <laughs> I, just, I went down like a rabbit hole of learning quantum mechanics, which is the strangest thing for a musician to learn. But it just <laughs> I was fascinated by it. And uh, decoherence was something I found <clears throat> by learning about quantum mechanics. And it has something to do with like uh, two objects appearing at the same time um, in different places. Uh, it's it's kind of complicated but i don't anyway i was like i really enjoyed uh the the idea of how it could be used as a metaphor so i named the song that and then jesse wrote lyrics kind of that 
match the definition of it and i just thought that was really fascinating and and all of our songs are like that like I'll, i named it first and then he used that name to write the lyrics which kind of like captured what i was feeling when i wrote the song to begin with you know and i just think that's a really fascinating way of of writing music it's like i was giving him prompts to write you know like writing prompts and he like actually used them to write you know the lyrics around i just it was it's like fun to write that way you know well i feel like it it allows for more creative writing like it, it's interesting yeah. you know it's i i have a love hate relationship with writing i like writing but i also hate it because i i hate having what i deem a better idea after I've spent like two hours writing something and then I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. So I'm going to delete <laughs> all of this, like 75% of what I just spent all this time doing. And then I'm going to start working on something else. But it was interesting because <laughs> I was talking to somebody about writing the other day and they're like, Oh, you know, like I love that you, that I feel like you put a lot of time and effort and, you know, into your writing. And I go, well, I do. And I go, but like what I tend to find for when I write, is I might have an idea or like a, a something in my head. And I'm like, bam, that's it. That's, that's fucking great. But I was like, you know, and, and the simplest way to explain it is like when I used to do the podcast, what I would do is I'd have a question that I was like, man, that is a really fucking good question. And I would write it on something and I'm like, okay, that's not a first question. You can't just write out the gate and be like, <laughs> blah, here it is. I can't do that. I got to yeah. set it up. So how do I get to this question? And I go, and I realize that my writing is a lot of almost like, I have an idea. How do I get there? I got to creatively get to this space so it doesn't feel so out of left field and is kind of breadcrumbs leading us there the whole way through. And sometimes I'll come up with a better question instead of the first one I started writing around. I go, okay, let's explore that side tangent. And then I'll kind of look at my collective writing and I go, okay, how can I marry these together to be one cohesive thought? And sometimes that requires nixing 85 percent of one thing to to make it make sense with the other and then expounding upon that but it is one of those things that i think when you kind of go into it with just what you're saying like a word all right what does that word mean oh it means these things you just kind of write these down all right well now we're kind of getting something as opposed to i have a song all right cool i have lyrics here let me try to shove these into the music yeah and a yeah. lot of times it's like that doesn't work and i feel like a lot of times the best music comes from a place of that's just organic and and it kind of has a, a sense of where it needs to go collectively yeah. and i feel yeah. like writing that way i feel like inevitably would just lead to better songwriting because you're, you're kind of thinking solely with a purpose in mind versus just trying to like here's this cool thing all right i gotta come up with the melody what's the melody uh come up yeah. with something okay now i yeah. got it now yeah. i gotta find words that fit to that melody and all you're doing is just it's kind of I've never understood people who do that because I feel like it it's those kind of musicians who are like, all right, I know that these chords work together. And I know if I go in an ascending scale or a descending scale, it creates this kind of vibe. And right. it's like paint by numbers. And it's like, that's not yeah. what music should be. It shouldn't be painting by numbers. It should be something that is a creative outlet for you and has to get out. So if it's yeah. not that, I, I, I just don't <clears throat> like that. Yeah. Personally. I'm the same way. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. And how I, I write music is the opposite of what you just, just described. I, I don't write, um, I, I, I know theory. I know music theory from, from doing it for so long. I definitely don't lean on it when I'm writing music. I don't even think about it. I don't care. I literally don't care. Like I, what I care about is, is the song and like how I'm, you know, what I'm working towards, like, uh, for the most part, I have a general idea when I'm starting a song of where I want it to go or the vibe I want it to have at least, or the, at least the feeling I want the music to have. And I just, I just do everything that I can to get there, to get that feeling. Mm -hmm. And when I finally feel it, it's like, okay, well, I'm here, you know, let's make this a song. And I don't, I, I really don't care about the scales or the, the chords, you know, like I, I just, I'm t I don't care. Like, I just like, I'll do anything. Sometimes I'll use like three different guitar tunings. I have like three different guitars and different tunings and I'll, I'll go switch them, switch them again, certain parts because like, I'm, you know, the part that I, the, the vision I'm having, the guitar I'm playing is it doesn't go low enough. I'm like, Oh shit, I need to get this guitar just for this one note. 
that's like really low it sounds crazy but it, it's just it's how i write i don't know i i don't i, I try not to stick to any like a uh, formula or or be like you, you know i try not to be like when i'm when i'm creating man i want to like i want to create art that like that you know kind of kind of create itself you know not, so like if i'm sticking to like a formula or something that like you know i learned or something i feel like it's not going to come out how i want it to come out it's not going to be as art as artistic as like i'm i'm really trying to you know what i'm saying like yeah so yeah i that's that's what i do as well so I think it's interesting that there's so many different ways people do the same thing and yeah. speak quote unquote, the same language. It's fascinating. It's, yeah, it is. And it's, it's always funny. Cause like one of my friends is like, you should come to the studio with us when we're working on a new song, help us write a new song. And I'm like, I was like, the people you have that do it are like, you know, you have a, you know, Josh Schroeder who like random awesome studios and stuff done like Lorna Shore and all that stuff. I'm like that dude can play like every instrument. So like, if he has an idea, he can literally go grab the thing or play the drums or do something and help flesh out the idea. I go, you have like another dude that's from another band. And I was like, and he can do a lot of the same things. And I go, my musical skill, I guess, or lack thereof is like, I can hear something. And I go, cut out that part, stop doing that. Like if you're doing it four times, cut it down to like three, bring this part back. Like do, do these kind of things. Or I hear this, or you, you did something that was really cool. Do that again. Yeah. I'm that guy, but I can't explain it to you. I, I can't go pick up a guitar and go, okay, so I'm thinking if you're playing this, do this under it. Like right. that's not, that's not my musical language. I, I can't do that. Yeah. And I was like, to me, that would be the most frustrating thing to have in a studio. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you have that, those kind of creatives who are literally like, Oh yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Let's do this real quick. Like that ain't me. And I was yeah. like, and I feel like that's not how you <laughs> should do that. And I was like, but I mean, I do find the creative process of working in a studio and, and doing all that, like the ability for songs to go from a demo, like the idea of a demo to pre pro to fleshing it out in the studio to what it is when it's fully mixed mastered. It is astounding how a song can start off one way and the different, places it went before it became what it ultimately became yeah it's so interesting to see how many different places that song could have gone and how it maybe started as a pretty eh idea yeah but then what it became you're just like holy shit that is yeah. phenomenal like i can't believe that came out of that and yeah that's like i don't my, go ahead no i was gonna say i just i i don't know if people have that love of music of just wanting to explore from concept to finished product I don't know if people care that much about the the music and the art that they ingest, but to me, it's something that I find infinitely fascinating because of the infinite possibilities of where you could take it. Like, and even from a production standpoint of like, if you would have made an acoustic guitar part be too bright sounding, then all of a sudden it completely changes the vibe of a song yeah. just from that one choice. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's like, you know, the process of, you know, for me, like writing, a lot of times is rewriting you know like you're saying <laughs> from the demo stage to the final master stage that's like that's like my favorite time in the writing process is like taking this like rough idea that i got out really fast and like and and, and figuring out a way to make it be the final song you know and it can be you know sometimes it can be really nerve-wracking because you can there's endless possibilities you can literally go anywhere with it so finding, uh, you know, finding the, the, the right parts and the right uh, structure, it, it's like a, a lot of it boils down to like feeling, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like when I finally like in, in, when I feel it and it's like it feels right to me, then it's that's when I feel like it's done. You know what I'm saying? But I love the process of turning turning something rough into something polished. It's like it's so fascinating to me. 100 percent. What? Uh you know with the year just literally being what 10 or 11 days old at this point hold on what is today today's 16 so as of when we're recording this the year is not even halfway through the first month uh i would assume more new music's on the way soonish yep. uh are you because i love talking about this you know you've been out of the music game for a little while and the industry has kind of shifted to more singles based things yep. and, and and just quick turning over of content is that something that interests you to kind of 
I don't want to say satiate potential listeners, but satiate you as a creative who wants to explore different sounds in a more natural progression versus, all right, we're going to work on this. And then in the next two years, I'm going to put out new music. And then in two more years, I'm going to put out new music. And it kind of creates this, well, where did this sound come from? What happened in that two year gap that, you know, led to these sounds? Is there one method that you prefer over the other with releasing sounds like color? Um, yeah. So like for me, for us anyway, the plan is to basically we, we want to release a song every month or every other month. And it's interesting because we have like we have if we release it that way, it, we have the next like year and a half already written mm. and finished, finished, completely done mastered fit mixed every it's completely done and I, I i don't know but you know if, if if we write something that the beauty of being 100 percent independent and releasing whatever you want whenever you want is i can change that schedule you know and i think we write a new song that i think that would do really well at a certain time we can we can do that because like we're not on a, i don't want to be on a label i don't want to do any of that i want to do it independent i want to enjoy just putting music out for people i'm not really like interested and and, and like I, I just want to put music out I, like my interests are literally in that alone like i'm not trying to do something some some crazy thing man. i just want to put music out for people to enjoy and so uh, releasing singles on a steady basis is, is kind of the idea that i feel like is going to work best for that you know it seems like you found twofold and speaking again, um, just as someone who's from some of the, the conversations we've had, not on record. Um, it sounds like you found what you didn't, couldn't find previously when we, when we did our other chats, like you sound like you're happy. You sound like yeah. you have a purpose that you found. And, and it's ironically, it was the thing you were running from the whole time. It was I know. the music that I think always gave you your confidence. Cause I mean, it, from our previous chats, you know, you always talked about how music was the one thing you could kind of turn to, to build your confidence in yourself. And it kind of been a really long, strange journey. It took you going back home and finding the confidence in writing and playing music to where I feel like outwardly you're the Tom that I think everyone knows and loves. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate that. And I definitely agree. It, um, it, it is, it is ironic that it was the thing I was running from, you know, but I think running from it uh, was an important part of my process. It was, it was really important for me to do that, to be able to reappreciate it, you know, and like, and find my love for music again, you know, because like, you know, one of the reasons I stopped writing music is because I kind of lost my love for it you know like the it, it was so it became so mundane and like like uh Work. you know yeah it was just it was just i was just not having fun you know what i'm saying and um so so stepping away for a while and like going through all the things i i had to go through i don't know it really like really i really gained a new appreciation and new perspective on on music and my love for music and my love for creating it and i feel like because of that and i can i'm definitely happy now happier than i've ever been and i'm able to create music that i probably wouldn't have been able to create before because of my mindset is different you know the way i i'm i'm creating is different because i'm thinking differently about it and uh so i'm definitely i'm definitely stoked i'm excited <clears throat> i'm excited to see where What's in store? Um, I still am holding out hope maybe that you finish. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Like, I feel like at one point, and again, this is like where it's like, did we talk about it on, on record or like in a text chain? But I feel like at one point you were talking about kind of telling the story of your life, but in a movie. Yeah. And it wasn't quite a biography, but it was sort of, it blurred the lines of biography in a, in, in a movie. Yeah. And I know you had said it started sort of with, the score you were working on initially informing the movie, which is funny because you were talking about how you, when you're writing stuff it and you can see it all visually beforehand yeah. as you're creating it. So it makes me wonder if you'll go back to at least finishing that project. 
I think, uh, you know, it's, so it's been in the back of my head for a while. I did, you know, I started it. I've written quite, quite a lot. I just, you know, my story's not finished. So there's, there's nothing really I can do with it right now. I'm, you know, I got to wait until, <laughs> you know, I guess the next few chapters write themselves. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks again for taking the time to do this. Um, like I said, it was one of those where I was really excited to, uh, reconnect with you. And, you know, I have a love hate with technology because, uh, as I had told you, sometimes I love technology that it can connect people with, you know, that are different places, different parts of their life. And, uh, I'm firmly a believer that sometimes, uh, people are reconnected when they're supposed to be. And yeah. it was a thing where I was kind of reminded, like, when I lost the number and, and just shit wasn't going well, I was like, fuck, I, I hope that like the dude doesn't think that I just like ghosted him and was like, nah, fuck this guy. Now like got what I could out <laughs> of him and, and gone. Cause like, that is really a big worry for me is, you know, like doing this. I feel like I, I always want to have this sense of integrity and that like, if we're friends and, and, you know, like, you know, we have the ability to like DM community, however our form of communication is. I never want it to feel like to the other person, I'm taking advantage of whatever I can get off of them. Um, yeah. So it's one of those things that like, when I started hitting you up again, I was like, God, I hope he doesn't think that I'm just like, Hey, you're back. Like, let's do this thing so I can get <laughs> oh, like some no. quick downloads off you or whatever. But it's, it's that. No, I definitely, I really, that at all. <laughs> but that I really wanted to, to reconnect with you and, and, you know, as we were texting a few days ago, I was like, dude, I feel like you and I are just like so much in the same headspace uh, through the things that we went through over the last couple of years of being apart, not communicating, that it just it feels good to be able to do this. And, and like I said, to see that you're doing well and to hear that you're doing well, like I, I literally can hear it in your voice. I can see it in your, your facial expressions and your body language. And uh, I'm fucking here for it, man. I'm glad to see that you I'm sorry you had to go through the shit that you had to go through, but I'm glad that it brought you here. And I'm excited to see whatever it is you do creatively uh, moving forward. Thank you so much. I really, man, I really appreciate that. I'm definitely, yeah. I'm definitely stoked. And uh, I definitely, uh, yeah, I appreciate your friendship for sure. Absolutely. Um, is there anything you would like to plug online or anything that you want people to know about? Uh, my band sounds like color has a song coming out on the 20th. So in four days, so look out for that. So you'll hear it. Uh, the 20th, so you'll hear it a couple of a couple of days before this episode comes out. <laughs> Hell yeah. So this will be out on Sunday. So oh sweet. Got some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, talk soon. Cool. Thanks, man. So that was my conversation with Tom. I uh, want to thank him once again for taking the time. It's uh it's been really good kind of reconnecting with some people that I, I've kind of lost touch with over the last two years or so. Um, like I said, technology is one of those things that I, I love it. It brings us together. It can also divide us, but I really want to make it stressed. If you feel like you should reach out to someone or you feel like you have something you need to say to someone, fucking say it. Honestly, reach out to the person and say it. Um, too often, as you heard me kind of say in the intro, I, I've lost a lot of close friends um, to kind of get really real and, and raw and vulnerable and brutally honest and be brutally speaking, you know, I sit in our house that I moved into with one of my best friends and he's no longer here. I had two of my other close friends move in with me at a certain, at different points of me living here. They are no longer here. And it becomes one of those things where I wish I could go back and I wish I could talk to them. I wish I could tell them things and, and I can't. Um, even to the point, oddly, before this conversation with Tom last night, you know, I had a dream about one of the people um, that, you know, I'd kind of lost contact with. And, and with them passing away, I I don't know, maybe the dream was a, a, a sort of illusion to the fact that there was no closure. And maybe this was sort of a, a small offering of closure, uh, even if it's if it's not real uh, in, in tangible, like I'm sitting across from this person. Uh, oddly, uh, I've made no bones about it on this show. There's, there's been a bit of a disconnect between my parents and I, uh, over the recent years. And oddly, my dad was involved, uh, in, in this dream and it could be nothing more than just coincidences, uh, in, in contained within my dream, uh, my subconscious kind of going to work. But at the same time, I, I feel like I woke up feeling, I woke up feeling kind of sad. I woke up feeling sad for time I had lost and am losing with with both of these people. And 
I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to. I don't want to live my life in the the what ifs in the gray area of I wish I would have. Um, especially when it's something as simple as picking up a phone or sending a text. It's that it literally is that easy. It literally is that simple. Um, too often we we just kind of get wrapped up in our own shit. And you know, coincidentally, once I woke up, probably within an hour of me being awake, I got a text from my mom that was just like, "Are you alive?" And I was like, I talked to you, and then I realized it's been probably a month, month and a half since I've even spoken to them. Um, I don't think I've seen my parents in probably almost a year, like physically seen them. And it's uh, it's a thing where we can be better, I think, ultimately, is what it boils down to. And that really was kind of the crux of the conversation that Tom and I had is is – Learning to be better as people, learning to be better spouses, learning to be better friends, learning to just be better and not wanting to be stagnant. Uh, as you heard us both say, you know, we think that, you know, and having nothing to live for and being stagnant is kind of what starts the decline of us as people. And it's in learning and it's in doing things and being stimulated that kind of allows us to, to continually live and feel young. Um, and we can't do that without those that mean something to us. So... Something I've been thinking about uh, since the conversation, um, something I was thinking about before the conversation started with Tom, but definitely one of those where, you know, I, I constantly say that this show is a form of therapy for me, um, you know, talking out ideas, talking out something I'm thinking about with, with strangers or s- someone I know um, is really therapeutic. And honestly, I hope maybe it, it does something for you. Um, I know at the tail end of this past year, I had someone that listens to the show uh, reach out to myself, and and I know Dan from uh, X Discography Discussion, DFT's Dungeon, and formerly of this show, you know, we got mail, literally mail, handwritten, expressing how our shows mutually help this person get through some tough times, and uh, I don't think we, we think about those things. I don't think we think about the impact that things we do or say can have on others and how, you know, the old saying is, you know, treat others how you would want to be treated or you never know what someone's going through. So treat them with kindness um, was very much something I, I guess I didn't realize um, even kind of going a little bit further on this same topic and talking points. Uh, even today I, I was talking to someone I haven't talked to in a while uh, in an email and was just like, man, my year kind of sucked at the end, but took some time off from the podcast uh, while the, the industry was kind of shut down for the holidays and, and kind of recharged. And, you know, it was kind of interesting to hear this person also say the same thing. Like it was a real rough end of the year, but I'd been taking some time to recharge and uh, to, to just kind of get through it. And I feel, I feel like I'm coming out on the other side of it a lot better and more excited about this new year. So um, keep your head up. Times are tough. Um, hopefully this, this chat was something maybe even if just an hour and a half to take your mind off of a problem that you have been stressing about. Uh, maybe this has just been that for you. Um, so I'm going to start wrapping up this episode. I know it was kind of long. The intro and outros are kind of longer now that I'm not really, uh, using them as just a way to talk about the episode, but to kind of talk through my own shit as well. Um, if you would like to keep up with Tom, uh, you can find sounds and sounds like color. Uh, you can find them on Facebook. However, it is not under facebook.com slash. Uh, basically, you're just going to have to go to Facebook and type in sounds like color. Uh, it'll pop up. And you can find them on Instagram at sounds like color music and Twitter at sounds color. Or you can go to sounds like color dot band slash decoherence. Um, if you like keep up with Tom, you can find him at Tom Denny music on Instagram. He has a Twitter. It doesn't look like it's been updated since about... 2018 or so so while not super active on it can be fun to take a stroll down memory lane of what he had been posting over the years um but really just like i said want to thank him for taking the time and just love this dude and love the fact that you know he is in a way better space than than the last time he was on the show um so all of those things said if you like keep up with the podcast you can find a simple enough bruce speak pod on all your socials uh, we are there you can email me brutally speaking at gmail.com uh let's keep conversations going if you find something on there enjoyable let's keep chatting uh if you want to hit me up on any of the socials same thing just go ahead and do that and uh for the podcast i will talk to you all next time i uh, got a few more guests in the works i haven't recorded them yet so i don't know what is officially coming up next but very much looking forward to having you check that out enjoy your week